Hello, it is Tuesday night, and I am Dr. Boz. We are going to talk about how motivation is overrated. Environment is everything. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Show. We have a lot to cover tonight, and it's been a couple of weeks since we've had our uh, our attendance for a, a series I'm calling Atomic Keto, piggybacking off of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, and trying to really dive deep into how do you change behavior, how do you really get into this ketogenic lifestyle and stay there, not to relapse in and out. And I've had 20 plus years of internal medicine to tell you those behavior changes are a lot harder than writing a prescription and sending the patient out the door. So stick around tonight, we're gonna talk about some sequences that we've been working on and we've got some pretty great updates for you starting tonight as well. So there are some traditions. First, I check numbers, and I was having my support group this morning here in Tampa, uh, a free support group that if you're looking for one, I host one here in Tampa, and I encourage all the folks out there that are trying to do the best on their ketogenic journey to host their own um, uh, support groups. And I was sharing that I started today's fast at about noon on Saturday, so I am kind of closer to about um, about 50 hours of fat, uh, no, about si almost 60 hours of fasting by now. Um, I am not sure that's going to do it. I think I need to prick my finger again. I did this last week and wasted another strip, so I'm just gonna poke again before I do that. Um, I do have some other announcements that I'm really excited to make that I've been trying to put off and I've got them organized enough for tonight. So here is ketones coming down for 10 seconds and um, there is glucose coming down for five seconds so yeah I was I could have guessed that my ketones were gonna be that good and <laughs> my glucose wow that is good I'll tell you I felt this about three o'clock this afternoon when I was working on a couple things trying to do some writing and I can almost hardly contain how good I felt uh, so I was like well I hadn't, I don't, those are live numbers. I really do check my numbers live. So I was like, I don't know what they're gonna be tonight on the show, but they are for sure a better um, reach than I've had in the past. So just checking in on those of you that are leaving comments, I really do appreciate that. We've got some folks from Michigan. We've got some uh, of the staples that are uh, here from California. We've got some friends that are local, Eileen. And somebody from Georgia, Hiawassee, Georgia. Welcome, welcome, seriously. Thank you for joining in. I love hearing where you're from. And I really do attempt to create a community here. Um, as I look at the uh, number of things I'm trying to accomplish on tonight's show, um, I'm gonna start with, actually I'm gonna start with this spot uh, because I have a really big announcement for, um, for two things. I'm gonna, take, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to this spot first. Uh, BozMD.com has a couple of places where I just want to shoot cleanup. Um, I, I do have a button here called Dr. Boz Favorites. I'm just going to highlight that. There are several things happening tonight that um, if I don't have all the links quite uh, easy for you to follow, you can always find them on the Dr. Boz Favorites. Um, I do want to say, we've been t saying for a few weeks now that Pella, Iowa, is doing something that I just think is really generous and I want to see if you can help with um, just giving them praise. Uh, for starters, on uh, bozmd.com, you'll see way at the bottom, one of my favorite things is the brains course. And there is a review at the bottom of there talking about other people who have taken um, this um, brains course called uh, From Trauma to Repair. Before I was a keto, <laughs> you know, did all this stuff about keto online, um, this is where I focused, was how to get peak brain performance uh, out of folks that are either want to help other people get a good and healthy brain, or if they've had any struggles, if they've had depression, if they've had sleep problems, if they've had chronic diabetes, um, or in any other ways that their brains aren't working so great. I am super thankful for how well um, the, the human brain will heal if we give it the right answers. So there's a brain course that I have been giving for several years. It's grown to over 12 hours long. 
it is online and I have marketed it to find the people who want to not only be serious about healing their brain, but who are willing to help the others. Because I think every teenage boy, I have three sons, and I swear that um, education of having to advance mom's slides <laughs> as I give this talk really set them up for, for success. So I'm looking for other people that want to lead the course for them, and I've priced it that way on the website. But many folks have said, I can't afford that. And Pella, Iowa was one of the first places that really supported me um, before anybody knew, knew who I was. Uh, they, they have um, asked me to come to Pella. I think this is the fourth time, third or fourth time. Anyway, I, I love the town. They are really committed to improving the education about brains and how to heal brains. And they are sponsoring anybody who wants to come to the workshop can come for free. Um, there might be a nominal fee for a little lunch, but for the most part, um, you can register online now. It is over those first few days um, in June, Thursday, June 2nd at 9 a.m. and then Friday, June 3rd, uh, ending at about 2 p.m. And I'll tell you, I'm super excited. I haven't been in front of a live audience for this workshop in, since before the pandemic, and I'm so excited to do this. So um, come to Pella. You have. <laughs> It's near Des Moines, which might be the closest hotel room. Um, there are a few hotel rooms in Pella, but the, the price is right because they are sponsoring this talk, which I love to give. And there is nothing like a community that comes together to learn about their brains. So uh, if you want to sign up for this um, ever bright um, uh, link, it's in the show notes. So you can check on that. I also have some of my helpers that have the link that can share it on the chat. So you might find it in the chat. Um, so the next thing I have is I have a special for you that um, I, I'm always looking for a good way for anybody who listens to me to get a good deal. And um, I use these meters, right? Um, they're kind of expensive, uh, but there are times when they're super for sale. And this is one of those times. So I have a, uh, I'm going to flip over to a different, um, this one, yeah. So this, uh, again, you'll find the link in the show notes for Foracare, but they have some of the uric acid strips. And I, I'm a little nervous to check it online because I'm so far into my fast that uh, uric acid is one of those um, point of care tests, like checking glucose, like checking ketones, that when you have a, um, when you're fasting, you are really churning autophagy. You're churning some of those um, proteins that need to be recycled and uric acid will rise as you fast. So I can check it, but it might be pretty high as I'm in over about 60 hours of fasting. Um, but uric acid is one of the things that I plan on talking about in the next season that I have a few slides, a couple of live events where I'm deciding between talking about autoimmune versus uric acid. Um, again, a really important part of a metric for health measurements. And instead of coming to me and having your physician order that uh, uric acid, you should check it at home. You should check it more than once. You should follow it. Um, but the cost to get started can be a little bit hefty. So they have test strips uh, that are going to expire. And they've put together these kits that um, come with a meter. They come with um, the, the spring-loaded lancets uh, and uh, the and they have 10 uric acid strips. Uh, and it's a great deal because if you put in the promo code B-O-Z-U-R-I-C, Boz Uric, it's 50% off. So not only should you do it because you get the 10 strips, if you already have a meter and you're looking to either gift it to somebody or have a great Christmas gift and you're done in uh, May or whatever, or April, uh, the, there's only 120 of them that they're going to sell at this lower price. So those of you that put that promo code in and get it, um, gift it to a friend if you need to, but it's the cheapest I've ever seen a meter. Uh, so again, the link to that will be either, it's in the show notes, but it's also something I have my helpers that can share um, online uh, here in the chat. And again, uh, that promo code is Boz Uric. Okay, I have one more amount announcement before we get to the um, before we get to, or maybe it's two more announcements before we get to the next one. Let me take this away and let me put this up. Um, so uh, there is a, there is one summit every year that I, I count down to, and that is the Metabolic Health Summit. 
So let me describe this before you book a ticket. Um, because if you see in this um, promotion over there, I have well, over, over over there, there you go, uh, that virtual general admission for $100 is what I am recommending to people that follow me or if you want to learn about some science. Um, it is really sciencey. I have recommended that people go to this before and they kind of got irritated because it's a bunch of scientific papers talking about the metabolic changes of a ketogenic journey and how can we use ketosis in the world of medicine to enhance health? So, you know, the thing I get known for is that I translate the advanced science into a very relatable conversation. But it means I need to have access to the advanced science. So even if this isn't your thing, um, I don't get any money from this. I just really love helping these people continue to put on what I think is the best scientific conference for uh, metabolic illnesses and that involves the ketogenic diet that involves using a state of ketosis um, and really studies on this is one of the conferences where I learned that supplementing ketones isn't the enemy which I thought it was when I first started uh, using a, a state of shifting chemistry for the patient and then teaching them how to get consistently keto through watching the other patients that were succeeding and especially those that struggled. We got them over that threshold and man, did they succeed after that. I learned that at this place, at this conference. So um, as a virtue signaling that I said I would help promote their, their um, online tickets, um, if you want a few lectures for, and you want to put money towards what I think is the greatest cause for doctors like me to step outside of that circle of um, standard insurance, uh, working in a practice with lots of other colleagues and following the national guidelines to give you every prescription that matches up with a symptom. And yes, I did that for 20 years and I still use prescriptions. I still find Western medicine very helpful. It's just not the best answer if you're gonna live in vitality. There's much more to it. And this conference really does a great job of teaching physicians like me how to bring you the greater information that's not just whimsical, not just what I see in my clinic, but truly is evidence-based and it is awesome. So I am super excited to go. I kind of like, that's um, when I have patients meet me or uh, people that have watched me on YouTube meet me, they they do a little fanfare. This is where I do fanfare of saying, I've read your papers and thank you for teaching me. So um, Metabolic Health Summit, it's coming up in about a month and I am going to go sit there, take notes and be a student of the, uh, of the process, but I offered to enhance their online sales. So if you, uh, if you do sign up, the money is going to an awesome cause. Even if only a few of the lectures or something you enjoy, maybe you may learn something, <laughs> maybe it will be, Maybe you'll scold me like a few other people did after I said, you should just go to this conference. And they're like, that's not me at all. All right, so I will get over to, um, let's see, that, I think I've got all that done. So now let me go to, <laughs> over here. All right, so we are getting into our series and I've done this a few, um, uh, let me see, where did that button go? Um, all right, so yes, this is our uh, Atomic Keto. So for those of you that haven't been following along, um, um, by the way, I am drinking my ketones. I don't know how I'm gonna make my ketones higher than 3.6 though. So I drink ketones every week to show you that there's a way to scam people into ketones and then there's a way of ketones that should raise your numbers. So this is a live show, for real, it's a live show. Uh, I drink these ketones during, <laughs> the, um, during the lecture and then I check them at the end. Oh, my, my folks are telling me that I forgot one thing. So there are other places that I am speaking over the next few months. And um, I have a an event next Wednesday that is on um, Clubhouse, which is an app that is um, not Twitter, not, um, not the traditional apps, but it's a place of communication. So uh, we will be doing that next Wednesday. We'll have the link for that uh, live interaction um, uh, on the show next week, uh, but that's for me to talk about uh, the uh, Keto Orlando, the Orlando Keto Summit, uh, and I'll do that next Wednesday on um, Clubhouse. Uh, the other major event that we are doing is I will be speaking at KetoCon, and that is in July, the first week of July, um, 
Orlando Keto Summit is in August. Uh, and then there is the Low Carb Cruise, which uh, I've just uh, been acquiring a another uh, lecture. So I picked up another lecture just filling in for some folks that weren't able to make it and happy to do that. Um, so those are the announcements. I told you there's a lot of announcements this morning or this evening. All right, so here is our atomic habits that we're talking about. So we started out a few weeks ago saying, yes, this book by uh, James Clear is something that I wish I would have had this book when I was starting my practice, really trying to coach patients into a better lifestyle of uh, actually changing behavior. I can't tell you the number of times I said, okay, we are going to start this blood pressure medicine, but we're only going to have you take it until you change behavior. And then I really uh, didn't help them change behavior. I just said, you should change behavior. <laughs> Go do it. Um, so this this book really helps to outline that a lot better. Over the years, I've gotten a lot better at um, what are the steps needed for people to have actual consistent change. Um, so the first week we talked about who you really are, what your mindset is, uh, and how thinking about yourself is a key component to the sustained behavior. The way you, you have self-talk, the way you say, this is my future self, this is who I am. Instead of saying, I want to be a runner, or I want to quit smoking, or I want to give up carbs, it is, I am on a ketogenic diet, I am keto. Uh, that's an identity shift on how you identify yourself. That um, the mindset for um, placing you in the future really does track uh, how to stay consistent with a, a behavioral change. Um, I'm actually, I have a fancy little thing here that I didn't click on here. So let me take that away and do that guy. There we go. Um, all right, so then we start, the, uh, last week we started with one of the big pillars, the big laws of this book, which is make it obvious. When you're making a change in life, you're going to have the difficult times when it's, it's hard to remember, why am I doing this? Why am I torturing myself? Uh, but having a time when uh, you stop um, the relapses because you're making things very obvious. Um, tonight we're going to, well that's the same one as before, tonight we are going to um, start with this, which is um, the discipline or the, um, um, the uh, uh, being motivated to change behavior is completely overrated. What, what, is, the, what is a better approach is what we're going to cover tonight. So again, we want you to forget about your goals. That sounds a little counterintuitive. We want you to really focus on the system that you live in. Uh, I have two interns that have been around here and they've been watching me not only really embrace this book and try to change some of my behaviors, but uh, they've watched to say that I create an environment that makes it very easy for me to succeed at the office. Um, I also have been tracking the plate for when things go wrong. What persons am I around when I mess it up? What's the location? What activity am I doing? What time of day is it? And then what am I feeling emotionally? Like what are, what's pushing on me to, to fail? Uh, collecting those little plates, which I have you put on, I recommend you put on three by five note cards because we want you to lay them out so you can analyze yourself a little better. It isn't one moment of not, of messing up a habit that you can reveal some of the psychology that you can pay a lot of money to look into further with the therapist, but identifying it is where I think most of the money is uh, wasted because it is that personal look at yourself, analyzing the, uh, yourself to a point of uh, really improving that. Um, that when you look at most people who start this, the process of changing, uh, they say, yes, I want to be skinnier. Yes, I want to stop smoking. Yes, I want to be healthier. Um, yes, I want a, 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 you know, a sharper memory. They look at the outcomes and they do not start with identity. Unfortunately, that really does set people up for failure. We want you to identify who you want to become. James Clare writes about this very lovely in his book. Uh, and as you look at the improvements for how do you stay consistent um, with a, a change, it is a major shift in please put that identity really um, at the highest level of not just your priorities, but your thinking, the way you think about um, a mess up, the way you think about a behavior change. Uh, that grace of, for yourself of I messed this up, but I am, I am keto. I, holding on to that identity as you get through the hiccups of uh, behavioral change, very powerful. 
um, that the next step really does outline the whole book <laughs> on this slide. And we're looking at the cues that you have for a behavior change, what cravings can you ignite that are in the positive instead of uh, always thinking of cravings as a problem, uh, really satisfying the response of what you're looking for, really identifying that, and knowing that that reward needs to be close enough in this cycle of your change to really stay uh, in, that, in that mentality. That human mind doesn't do as great with long-term gratitude. You really do need to reward it in the short term. Uh, so kind of focusing on the problem phases versus the solution phases, that cue craving is um, in a, this is where we can easily see our, the problems we're struggling with. Like on a ketogenic diet, I, in our support group this morning, uh, it, it is impressive to me how a change in behavior um, can be reintroduced uh, to uh, people again and again. And sometimes it's a, a, a tiny amount of education. Sometimes it's hearing somebody else's story do the exact same thing that you did that finally triggers their cue to, oh, I really need to change the environment that I'm in. I need to make this an easier story. Here's how the success has worked for me in the past. Um, those, uh, uh, that's where tonight's focus is, is we're going to talk about why making it obvious is a major part about your environment and not about how disciplined are you, how motivated are you, how committed are you. I think those are more like cuss words when you're trying to change behavior. Uh, it is in the, um, it's in your environment that we really are able to change things. <clears throat> So yes, last week I said goals are for setting direction, but systems are the best for making progress. Uh, <clears throat> so hold on here, I'm gonna click back over to, um, uh, I can blow this one actually. So I don't know if you noticed, but I'm in, my, I'm in one of my new locations. Uh, it's in my office, but I think it's the third time I've designed this room to see if I can improve how uh, the sound was. So. Um, I'm hoping it's not as echoey as it was the first time I did this, but it's in my new location. Um, my it's supposed to be my recording room, but I haven't. This is the first, first second week I've used it. Um, so yes, when looking at um, uh, some of the system changes, I like to point out uh, several of the things where we are trying to transmit these ideas, not just in a glib way where. Uh, you show up and say, here's a few rules to make life more consistent. Here's how you stay consistently keto. Um, I think that's almost as easy as physicians writing that prescription saying, go take care of your blood pressure and you should lose some weight. Um, that uh, attention to how do you truly engage in a process that changes behavior. Uh, I try to be as vulnerable as I know how on this Tuesday night show about the changes I'm trying to make. And if you're looking for a written version of that that is quite paralleled, um, we send out emails each week and my sister-in-law, Michelle, is in charge of writing those. She was also the star of our documentary that was on YouTube, American Traditions, where we talk about your traditions in America are so rooted in eating and consuming carbohydrates that uh, it is truly an addiction that this, this Atomic Habits book is commonly used in the, by my colleagues that take care of addiction for a full-time career. Uh, and although theirs can be illegal substances, I think it might almost be more difficult to take care of some of these addictions um, that are legal, like carbohydrates. So uh, as you read the emails, you'll see Michelle's journey on how she's trying to change a behavior. And we are trying to be as honest as possible saying it's not perfect, um, but we do encourage you to open up those emails and really give us feedback on whether you're finding value in reading her story. And then Tuesdays, you get to hear a little, about, a little bit about mine. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples about why uh, does making it obvious um, and making it, um, I'm gonna see if I can sit down without ruining too many things here. Um, let's see, that's not too bad, okay. Uh, <clears throat> when I look at some of the, um, the successes and, and struggles I've had changing a behavior, um, I've had a clinic that's had lots of people in it, you know, several staff members, all of their habits get brought into the office and that habit turns into a tradition in the office before you know it. Um, 
And then I've tried to clean that up. I've tried to say, this is a carb-free environment. I remember the first one of the times I got written up, I was working for a, um, one, of the, one of the hospital systems and I refused a cake. I took the cake that they bought me and threw it in the garbage saying it's not appropriate. And I got written up for it. And I, and I didn't do it in a, in a snarky way. I just said, I don't like it. If you want cake for, your birth, for my birthday, go ahead and have it. I'm not eating it. And they said, we won't eat it without the first bite. I said, if you're depending on me for the first bite, and then I threw it in the garbage. And they wrote me up, yeah. <laughs> so disruptive, yes, probably. Oh, what was happening though in that clinic, and I've seen happen in, when I had my own, when I started my own clinic, it, it wasn't the plan at the beginning, but it didn't take long for the whole office to be a place where people brought their goodies, their latest recipe, and we had taken what celebration should have been embracing one another, being a, a colleague and a friend as you, because you take on a work environment that uh, working in medicine is very stressful, that that support from one another is critical for staying in the game, for not getting uh, tapped out because of the stress or the burnout. And we were celebrating with food just like anybody else. So um, the pandemic did wonders for, we all the staff had to trade over. I was stuck in Hawaii for 93 days. Uh, and then as I decided, okay, I'm gonna recreate this world in a way that has a better environment. Um, especially moving to Tampa, I refuse to buy a microwave for this office. Uh, I want nothing to do with food while I'm at the office. I've had several colleagues, several friends say, can I just take you out for lunch? Can I um, bring you over lunch? I'm like, no, we don't eat at the office. And I find that rule, that, that beginning rule where the environment is set up to be a place that doesn't smell like food, that has, um, actually my favorite thing is to, to put a lavender in a diffuser. <laughs> I love the smell of that. So it smells like that when you walk through the door. It doesn't give the trigger of coffee or food. And that is so traditional in how I've set up the environment for my work environment in the past. Without doing that, I am. it is so much easier for me to stay the course. Um, now, I still screw it up in a lot of places, but at the office, it isn't a place. The things I have at the office are, I have some of those carnivore crisps, um, and I have sardines, and I use the carnivore crisps to eat the sardines if I need to eat at work. Um, and it is rare because once, it's not a temptation, once you stop thinking about it, and when you have really adapted into a ketogenic journey, I have plenty of stored calories that as long as I push through uh, the moments of temptation, my, my metabolic system will ignite and I will hit a ketone of 3.6 and a glucose of, what was it, 60 something at the beginning. That, that really is possible. Um, but I, I, I contend part of it is that I didn't discipline my way into that. I didn't try to stay motivated because uh, if you've ever been around people trying to change, you know, January 1st is an excellent example of everyone will be ready to change behavior on January 1st, and they're usually done by February 1st, that the motivation will fade. But setting up a system that really does improve the chances that you're going to follow through begins with a few steps uh, that are really focused on that identity and that system. Uh, let me hop back over to the slides and walk through some of that um, that change. Let's go. Um, here we go. So, um, so past the goals, um, the number one thing when you're looking at how do you change uh, a behavior, uh, there is a powerful uh, mental wiring when you write it down. I didn't ask you to fill out those three by five note cards because I wanted you to throw them away. I really expect a behavior change and to ignite that, to help you with that. I'm pushing you to write down those four things, uh, those five things, that person, location, um, activity, timing, and emotion. Yeah, sorry, I had to add them out in front of me. Uh, to, to really evaluate yourself. Um, writing down a real plan does matter. Um, when you look at the motivation is overrated, environment wins, uh, it starts uh, with one of the, one of the ways, ways to look at this is the study that James Clear writes about in his book. He says, okay, there are three groups of people. 
and they were pretty healthy, but they were trying to improve their exercise. So they ha to get into the study, they had to have a little bit of exercise, but they were trying to make it better. And um, group one was the control group, and they just needed to track their exercise. So write down their exercise and tell how, how, you, um, how well you've exercised. The second group was just like group one in that it tracked their exercise, but now they were going to get this nice motivational speech on how important it is to exercise and how you lower your blood pressure when you exercise and how it is good for your mind and heart and, 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 and okay, it was lovely. But um, the third one was to track your exercise and they had to, they wrote down, they, so they sat there and wrote down the plan of how they were going to exercise. And um, it was almost double the amount of people of, of exercise that was tracked in the third group when compared to the other two. Meaning the motivational speech hardly did a thing <laughs> to change outcomes and really statistically unmeasurable on how it impacted their behavior. But when they were asked to write down a plan uh, and they got a little more specific, uh, they said, we don't just pick a plan, but we, we want you saying what is the exact time and when are you going to be doing this? Uh, I've had this happen in the past as well. One of the things I'm not very good at tracking has been my weight. Uh, I think it's because it's been over emphasized and over celebrated and over penalized weight has, but it is an actual important metric to, to take a look at, to keep track of. And writing down my weight was something I did for a, a short time but I never had an exact plan of when I was gonna check it. Uh, so what was this is part of the things I'm working on. So the way that, um, one, of the, one of the tricks, and one of the ways to build on uh, a, a habit of, uh, that maybe you've already got a good habit that's happening in your life, that's uh, something we went through a couple of weeks ago saying, write down the steps that you do every day. And so in my steps I do every day, I get up, I put my contacts in, I brush my teeth. And as I'm brushing my teeth, which is a stable routine part of my day, I now step on the scale. I did something called habit stacking. I added a, a step to an already stable routine. And I'll tell you that I started that plan a little bit when I was reading the Atomic Habits, but a few weeks ago I mentioned it on the show. So I said it out loud. And I had, um, you know, had written down uh, the idea of changing it, but never a very solid proclamation. I am going to step on the scale while brushing my teeth every morning. And I'll be darned, I've been so good about it since, <laughs> since that show. Uh, again, stating it out loud, stating exactly when I'll do it, uh, changes how well you stick to a plan. So this habit stacking works with positive habits. It also works with not so positive habits, uh, it creates a scent of momentum. A couple of weeks ago, I, I mentioned that if I wanna screw it up, if I wanna do this other habit that I have, which is when I get home, especially on Tuesday nights when it's been two days since I've eaten, um, it's now, an, it's about a 40 minute commute to drive home. And when I drive home, I'll think about some of the food I want to eat. And if I walk through the front door, which is right next to the kitchen, I open up the fridge without even thinking. I just, it's so reflexive, I don't even think about it. And so to change my environment, to walk through a different door in the house that puts me into the bedroom where I change my clothes and I get on my jammies and I then wanna wind down, not starting with food as I wind down, almost mindlessly eating while I wind down, those behavior changes are about resetting the environment. Uh, so. Number one was habit, habit stacking. I put a good habit next to, uh, I put a habit I want to, want to establish on top of a good stable habit, like brushing my teeth. Not even that exciting. I'm not even sure I would have called this a habit had I not gone through that checklist of what do you do, what's the first 20 things you do every day. Um, and then how do I find a habit that I'm doing that's not so good, which is I walk through the front door on the way home and sometimes I don't think about food. I really don't. I, I think about all the things I have in my day and I'm either talking to my son or um, calling my sister or just decompressing. 
But if I get to the house and I'm thinking about food, I open the front door and before I can even hardly think of uh, these, you know, what am I doing? There's an automatic process of getting to the fridge and opening it. So to stop that automatic process, I'm now walking in a different door. And when I walk in that other door, it does change how likely I am to screw this up and end up eating out of the fridge without even thinking. So again, habit stacking and then changing the environment for which you're entering into the habit. Uh, that of course only happens if you've written it down. Um, and let's see here, the final thing um, is the Diderot effect. I'm just gonna show you that slide really quick and then I'll pop back over. Um, so yeah, plan for the Diderot effect. So Diderot is a, um, uh, a I think he's a real person, um, but he, the, it is named after someone who, oh yeah, I think he was the encyclopedia maker. So that um, he, James Clear writes about this, this in his book that he was, um, he had worked towards writing the first, or one of the first uh, comprehensive encyclopedias. And when he had run into financial trouble, um, some level of royalty, whether it was the queen, that's how I remember it, but maybe it wasn't quite the queen, said, I will, I will fund that person so, because she liked reading this encyclopedia. And she gives this money to a man, last name whose, man, whose name was Diderot. He bought a robe. And as soon as he was in the robe and looking how stylish he looked in the robe, he noticed that his shoes didn't go with the robe. And then it was another layer of outfits that didn't go with it. So the first, the first buy of a, of a clothing led to the second buy, led to the third, third, fly, third buy. And that momentum is what we are trying to help with as you stack a behavior onto the next behavior. Although the Diderot effect refers to buying one thing and then buying the next thing and buying the next thing, and it really does, there are sales that track and really uh, exploit your Diderot effect that if you bought this, then I can target them for that because they're gonna wanna have that. Um, but you can also use the Diderot effect as a momentum builder for uh, your behavior when you're going in the right direction. Uh, so as soon as I started doing better at stepping on the scale, uh, I started to write down another habit, which is, uh, I do like red wine. <laughs> I like it. I've learned I don't think very well the next day. I, I'm definitely, it's something I do less, 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 and less. Um, and I know that when I go out to eat, which I'm not used to eating out this much, but I live a long ways from my house, so if I have to eat at night, um, if I go out with my husband, Oh, oh, a glass of wine sounds lovely. But I do a lot better job if I start with a bubble water. In fact, most nights when I start the meal with a bubble water, which I call Perrier bottle, uh, you know, agua con gas, <laughs> it's, it's got, got fudge, fudge in, in it. it. I, I often, often don't, don't want, want the wine. wine. Um, it's, it's a mentality, mentality that, that once I begin a behavior, behavior and then the next behavior happens and the next behavior happens. As, as I write down, down the next new thing that I'm trying to put a good habit next to, I enjoy eating out with my husband. I don't enjoy what happens after more than one glass of red wine. And if I start the meal with a glass of red wine, sometimes there's two glasses of red wine, and I don't feel good the next day. So the behavior change is how do you start with just the one glass of wine, or uh, the bubble water, and only if I have any, I'll have one glass of wine. Again, uh, it is a place where I continue to work on this, and I, if you've followed me a long time, I've had several times I've gone backwards and said, okay, I've given this up, and uh, then I read about it, and I realize it's terrible for me, but I still end up having some from time to time. I am human, and I do make mistakes, so. Um, all right, so we are getting to the end of, uh, I stood up there, so I think I know what happened. Uh, so hopefully that sound is be better for you. Please tell me if it's not. And I will start taking on your questions. So many of you have written in the questions. I'm just pulling up that document over here. And I uh, have several of you that have asked, um, and we will pop those questions into our document. Now I hope... Um, Yes, it's working. Thank you for that. I wanted to do that before I flipped over. So if I need to switch it, I know how to fix it. Uh, so here we go. Good keto questions. And I think it is working correctly. So hopefully the echo didn't start when I changed scenes there. 
Okay, so we are in April 5th. Uh, I have a couple of, oh, let's center that up a little better. What happens after reaching the ideal weight and reversing my prediabetes to regular blood sugars? Uh, is my body ever able to detect insulin or do I have to fast and watch carbs in the long run? Okay, that is a great question <laughs> and I have um, several. In fact, one of the best parts about having a, um, a group of people in the mornings on Tuesday is, I'm, oh, it's echoing again, hold on. Okay, so now is the echo gone? I don't know if it's gone. I didn't do anything different. So I'll watch to see if the echo's gone, and if it's not, I'll flip back over to the other scene and we just won't have the words up on the screen. Um, all right, so um, the question is, will my body ever be able to detect the insulin in the correct way? Um, thank you, no echo and echo echoing, I appreciate the feedback. Um, when I look at those, uh, the long-term struggles, with insulin, with long-term struggles of, I've been overweight for many years, I've had high blood pressure for many years, lots of things got better over uh, the course of um, the, the weeks or months, usually it's months, uh, of being keto. And they want to say, now can I go back uh, to what I did before? And I will tell you, it's years. It's years of a stable blood sugar before I would ever encourage them to do that. One of my favorite people to follow, and he has taught me as much as I hopefully have helped him, and that is, we call him Patrick V. <laughs> He's on the podcast tonight, he helps us out. Um, and he is great, but one of the best parts about Patrick V is he is a freak of nature. When I ask him to do something, when I have given him instructions, whew, he does it without, um, without fatigue or complaining or uh, he really sticks to a plan and changes it. And Patrick has been one of the best uh, examples of a very studious person who you know, showed up wanting the ketogenic diet, improving his health from an ICU because his health was so terrible. Uh, it had chronic illness all the way down to his kidneys. It had uric acid too high, it had, he had high blood pressure, he had diabetes, he had doctors throwing prescription atoms at him. I've done that, it's not, a, um, it's not a fault of his physicians. But by, oh boy, was it a wake up call for me to see how in the perfect scenario, we used a continuous glucose monitor and when he was strict, his body, his blood sugar was perfect. I don't think I met, I've met someone who could do it as tight, be as tightly controlled uh, as uh, Patrick has been uh, and stay consistent because his human resolve is amazing. But he's reaped the benefits that he doesn't have high carbs because as soon as he does, those sugars do spike up. Um, it is a testimony. The reason I'm bringing out his example is um, when when Michael asked the question, can I, I've got my blood sugars controlled, I, I'm back down to doing things that appear to be okay. The years of excessively produced insulin have set your pancreas up and your system up to detect carbohydrates much more acutely, much more quickly. And as we try to reset your insulin, to pull away from insulin resistance, the memory is still there. The process of overshooting that insulin, of really overreacting to uh, those highly processed carbs, it's real. It's very uh, unfortunate, but I would tell you, you could try uh, looking at um, what happens when you put a bunch of carbohydrates in and seeing how high your sugars go. If you get above 180 within the, the two hours following the meal, that's a, that's a metabolic disaster. Um, if your sugars are not below 140 at two hours, we call that diabetes. This is a, a very distinct response. And even if their fasting sugars are okay, after the uh, two hours after eating something of rather high sugar content, if they can't uh, pull that sugar back down, it, it does pay quite a price to um, reversing to, to just being in that high metabolic state. 
So there's a way you can test this, Michael, is you can check your numbers. But I do not want you to show up to that test with the expectations that a body will, that has been improved will stay there without a long time spent normal. And I'll tell you that's one of the reasons I'm doing this atomic keto is I have people saying, I just need to be better for a while so I, my, my body's better. Then I can go back to abusing the foods and feeling the sense of comfort that I've known, I've grown to love. And I mean, I've had those thoughts too. Why do you think I still have a glass of wine every once in a while? I, I want that improvement in my, in my body to then say, oh no, I don't have to pay attention to some of these other rules. And it's just not true. I wish it were true, uh, but staying consistently keto, finding the pleasure in uh, a different journey, meaning finding the reward of teaching or giving or mentoring or being that um, the servants in our community, that's where the joy is sustainable. And it's not bad for your mitochondria. Um, when I look at folks who are always looking at, can't I just go celebrate yet? I really am, I focus on this series of atomic keto to say changing a behavior by really embracing a different life um, is is where the long game is for almost everybody that I've advised. Um, I don't want to say everyone, but almost everyone. All right, Sandra writes in and says there's a uh, there there a metabolic reason why carnivore leaning folks have higher glucose after moving from carnivore. Oh, ketovore. So why higher glucose levels after moving from ketovore? Okay, so she's saying the blood sugars are higher um, after they've been on a mostly meat-based uh, diet, and she wants to know well, why are your sugars higher? Almost always, it's because they have a, um, they've added more carbs than they should. Um, when I look at keto, ketovore, keto carnivore, um, they really do keep their carbohydrates under 20. When I'm first advising somebody, how do you get your carb, how do you get the number of carbohydrates under 20? Uh, how do you get that total daily number, not net carbs, total daily under 20? I tell them vegetables become a unit of how do you get the fat into your gut? And it isn't uh, an accident that most of the menus, people say, what do you eat in a day? I'm like, well, it's not much, and it is highly keto carnivore. When you add back the extra processed carbs, uh, especially if that particle size is small, they're processed in some way, uh, the foods are, it is amazing how quickly that insulin responds. So almost uh, pig piggybacking off of Michael's question, that they go keto carnivore, but they aren't healed. Their body is not got a hemoglobin A1C under 4.5. Their average blood sugar isn't 83. They don't wake up with a Dr. Boz ratio in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. It's much higher. Or if they've reached that, they've just done it for a short period of time. And unlike Patrick V, who has them for days on end, um, they did it for a short season, not enough to reverse the years of what excessive insulin did. So I don't talk about keto carnivore being the, the diet. I, I use the word keto, but I do talk about the rules of keeping that keto, uh, those total carbohydrates low enough. Uh, and that number 20 wasn't just something I grabbed out of the air. It's that the people who kept that total carbohydrates under 20 showed a progression of reversing the inflammation, getting off of the medications, having a the mental health that was improving instead of a almost a wasting effect where they were cutting calories and shutting down metabolism in a way that that wasn't very healthy um let's see here hmm. um okay so let's go back to the next question it's a great question though i wish it was so the, the reason it goes up is because uh they probably should stick closer to keto uh, their body's not metabolically healed yet Julia says, in the new book by David Pol uh, Pullmother, uh, talks about a pathway of uric acid in the body. He says, Hi, I actually read this question earlier. I don't know the answer to it. Uh, high salt intake might force the body to transfer glucose into fructose. I haven't read this. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then, have you heard that uric acid reduces dopamine receptors in the brain? Oh, uric acid, it is really impressive. Um, what uric acid is linked to. Um, 
So let me go back to the scene. So maybe I should try to check my uric acid up live. Uh, let's see, this is, yes, it's uric acid. So this is that test that I, I had at the beginning. That link is in the show notes. Um, I, I really do um, know that there are many types of, uh, ben many benefits to having a uric acid that is under 4.5, and that's really low. Now, I'm fasting, so I'm a little nervous to do this in front of everybody, but I guess it'll prove to you that I'm doing a live show. <laughs> and I think both of these are calibrated, these meters are calibrated to check uric acid. I know I just started one the other day. Uh, I, I've had that other meter for about four years, and it just stopped working. So I don't know if that's the shelf life, but so this is the uric acid, and I'll see if it's calibrated. Um, so while I'm checking the uric acid, I will answer the rest of that question. So the number of correlations to what uric acid is measuring, what it looks at, and why, why it's such a predictor of, of health. Um, I mean, I, I actually have uh, Dr. Pullmutter's uh, book to listen to on audiobook. I haven't done it yet because I am interested to hear. Um, it's something I've been researching over the last several um several, um, probably at least two years, uh, of how much uric acid shouldn't be just measuring gout. Uric acid is a byproduct of nitrogen. Nitrogen being something, uh, so my, my uric acid is 6.8, and I'll tell you the last time I checked it, it was about 4.3, um, but I am fasting, and I just wasn't sure how high it would go during fasting, so by, by watching that uric acid go higher, it's a reflection of of, I mean, I, I think of it as a poor man's way to measure autophagy. Yes, autophagy could be measured by the Dr. Boz ratio that we checked at the beginning of the show, and we'll check here again in just a minute. But the uric acid is also one of those long games. When, when folks come in and ask me about how healthy am I, I have a great example of if you've had, um, if you followed the um, consistently keto, uh, the third time I launched the course, I did a bonus round of here in Tampa, hosting a support group and here's what a support group looks like here's what i do during a support group so the bonus round for that was um, to watch what was happening in a support group and you got to meet the folks there i loved it it was meeting people from florida for the first time uh, and you got to hear people's stories and there was one woman in there who is north of 70 i'm pretty sure she's north of 70 she's older than 70 and she was super excited to be in the best health of her life for her grandkids and she had lost a bunch of weight. During the support group, I pushed her to say, I think you should, should, be, you should be doing this better. So I met her in October. Now it is the 1st of April. And one of the, one of the sessions, we checked everybody's uric acid. We used the four care and I just said, I just, if you wanna see one, one of the, like, you know, cut to the chase, what is a good one blood test that tells me how healthy is someone? Um, I look at uric acid. And she was, she's a nurse, she'd lost some weight, she was successful in the ketogenic, she'd already lost like 40 pounds or something. And her uric acid came back like 11 and a half. And I said, well, maybe you're fasting, maybe it's too high. She's, she's like, I've never had gout, I, I don't know why it's so high. And I said, well, check it again. So we got out another strip and we checked it again and it was over 12. I'm like, Okay, that's not a good sign. So I pulled her aside and said, yeah, that's actually a really important sign that even though your body has improved and you are so much healthier than you used to be, that uric acid is a product of what happens when chronic inflammatory problems and nitrogen, which is why nitrogen can be found in, in meat. It can also be part of, um, it, alcohol can make this higher. Uh, so you'll hear your doctor say, oh, if you have gout, if you have uric acid, uh, you should stop, or high uric acid, you should cut down on your meat and you should stop drinking alcohol. And you're like, no, 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 no. Those are just these tiny little ways that, are, that do impact uric acid, but you need to get that waste out of your system. You need, to, you need to ignite autophagy. And so as we talk about that, she began to kind of narrow her eating window um, down from, I think it was closer to six hours, down to almost three hours. Then she got closer to whatever, I can't remember if she landed at one hour or two hours. And then she stepped over a threshold and said, okay, I'm gonna do a 48 hour fast. Uh, and then after the 48 hours, she committed at the beginning of the year to doing eight 72 hour fasts, which is almost the, the pinnacle chapter of how do you see how strong your metabolism is 
is you stress it eight weeks in a row with 72 hours a week every consecutively uh, of fasting. And I mean black coffee, water, salt, that's it. Nothing else in the fast. Uh, and that's not something you wake up tomorrow doing. This is something she graduated to. But she just checked her uric acid um, in the last couple of weeks and it was, she's been checking it with her little meter, you know, two or three times a month. Um, not when she's fasting, uh, but over time. And she's down, I think it was 5.8, or it was in the fives. Um, amazing improvement of this woman over the age of 70 who has lost another 20 pounds and you can say, oh, she's losing too much weight, she's losing too much weight. I'm like, you sh her metabolism and her uric acid not only predicted that her brain was headed in the wrong direction. Uh, high uric acid is linked to increased Parkinson's, increased depression, increased Alzheimer's. Uh, it is that chronic inflammatory process that changes how your brain ages. And by lowering her overall body uric acid, and the way she did this was she had, um, she had a, um, a stress of her metabolism of no food for 72 hours, eight weeks in a row. She did not wake up three weeks into the ketogenic journey doing that. It took her six months to even think about it. And then it took her another three months to say, okay, I've done some shorter fasts. I think I'm ready for a 72 hour fast. And when she succeeded, she's like, I just couldn't believe how great I felt. Those are all good signs that she's at the right time. Her metabolism has been upregulated, is ready for this challenge. And by watching what her uric acid did over those eight weeks of fasting, she gets a new lease on life. All right, well, there are several other good questions out here that I should stick around and answer all of them for, but I am gonna check my numbers and call it a night. Um, there are links in the show notes. Um, actually, I'll do this again so you guys can see this. Uh, let's go side by side. There's that metabolic health one. Uh, if you, any, any uh, support that we can give, the Metabolic Health Summit, again, it helps me. Thank you. Um, and then if I take that away and I, let's see here. I do this one. This is the Foracare one. Now that, you have to put it, to get the 50% off, you have to use the promo code B-O-Z Uric. And I put the links in the show notes below, but I think there are some members of the team that will probably be posting that in the chat, so help yourself to those. Um, and I have, um, um, I have, I forgot what I was gonna pitch to. <laughs> Hold on here, actually, I know where this is at. Um, oh, I know that if you are looking at all this insulin questions that I have been I have been teaching about, I will have a link at the end of the show to um, to talk more about insulin, how it works, what are the myths, what are the truths about insulin, and I love teaching about insulin, so there's quite a good set of the slide deck there. As I prepare for some of my live lectures coming up, um, man, I spend an inappropriate amount of time working on those, <laughs> those slides. Um, let's see what my numbers have done uh, over the hour. So yeah, ketones 2.8, that doesn't surprise me. I, it went down over the month, over the last hour, uh, but it was really high. 3.6 is really high for me. So um, I'm definitely using the fuel and burning through it. <laughs> uh, and I had just a little bit of those ketones, so tonight was not probably the highest dose of those ketones. But um, again, I push my metabolism, not because I like giving up food any more, more than the next person, but because it does improve your health to stress your metabolism in a controlled way, and it does improve your health, one ketone at a time. Here at the Dr. Boz Show, we are here live every Tuesday night. Please keep dialing in and asking me those questions. I love this community, and I thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support showing up and words of praise as we continue to improve our health together. We'll see you next week and watch for those emails.